Imagine Ms. Williams' dilemma. She has just a few weeks to prepare for her classes, and she'll be starting a new school year soon. At the end of the spring, she was told that there are new state standards that are going to have to be met in the fall, and her school has developed a new curriculum as well. Additionally, Miss Williams learned that each department in her school has come up with new requirements for their programs. She is going to have to ensure that all of these requirements are met. Ms. Williams also thought about the particular classes and lessons that she has been wanting to develop to help her students learn. There are so many requirements from outside her classroom and there is so little time and resource available. What is Ms. Williams to do? The most important thing for her is to make sure that her teaching helps her students learn. It sounds like the state has many new objectives, the school and departments have many new objectives, and Ms. Williams herself has many new objectives. How can she possibly be successful implementing all of these new requirements and objectives along with improving the outcomes of her teaching? One possible solution for Ms. Williams may be to organize her goals and objectives to better understand and develop her instruction and to make them all more precise. She knows all her goals and objectives. Is there something else that can help? Perhaps she can use a taxonomy table. If she has her list of goals at all these levels, an instructional design process can help. Ms. Williams apparently has a list of objectives at a number of different levels, state, school, department, and unit. Some of the objectives, such as those from the state, the school, and the departments, have already been analyzed and are in the process of implementation. Ms. Williams, however, is just in the process of modifying her lesson plans and instruction. In all of those cases, these objectives have been intentional and reasoned acts. If the state and school have mandated standards, we can consider those goals to be somewhat global. Goals like those of the state and the school are likely very complex and will require lots of time and instruction to accomplish. These types of goals are very broad. These types of goals can likely be accomplished through establishing new curriculums. Each department in Ms. Williams School has also developed new programs. Those types of goals may be considered educational in that they are moderate in complexity and may take weeks or months to complete. They are probably accomplished through the use of units. Finally, Ms. Williams herself has some new objectives for the way she is going to teach. Her goals are a bit narrow and will probably take hours or days to complete. She will likely accomplish her goals through the use of lesson plans and daily activities. It's highly likely the state, the school, and the departments went through an analysis process to develop their goals and objectives. Ms. Williams has begun her design process to develop her instruction for her lesson plans and activities. Ms. Williams is in the analysis phase of the instructional design process, and she is looking to organize her list of goals that she has been analyzing and has written. If Ms. Williams uses an organizing framework such as a taxonomy table, her objectives and ultimately her instruction will likely be more precise and will promote understanding on the part of her students. In 1956, a taxonomy known as Bloom's Taxonomy was created by educational psychologist Dr. Benjamin Bloom and others. Their goal was to promote higher forms of thinking in education, such as getting students to analyze and evaluate rather than just remember facts. The taxonomy they developed looked at levels of cognition or knowledge, emotional skills or self, and psychomotor activities or skills. The product of Bloom's work became known as the Taxonomy of Educational Objectives, the Classification of Educational Goals, Handbook 1, Cognitive Domain. This handbook has been translated into many languages, used in many contexts, and has had a significant influence on education. Others have modified the early work of Bloom's taxonomy to account for new knowledge and new struggles that educators have encountered. 
Lauren W. Anderson and David R. Crathwall, along with others, are some who have provided a revision of Bloom's work. In 2001, they developed a taxonomy table which can help educators see goals more clearly and ultimately design and develop better instruction. Let's see what this table is all about. What is this taxonomy table and how can Ms. Williams use it to help her develop her own instruction? For that matter, what's a taxonomy? We've already made an attempt to define our objectives as part of the analysis phase of the instructional design process. We thought these objectives through and our efforts have been very intentional and reasoned to reach their final form. If Bloom's and others work was intended to promote higher forms of thinking and the taxonomy was the product of that work, let's see how that table can help. A framework can be thought of as a set of categories related to a single phenomenon. In our case, that phenomenon is educational objectives. That framework will be categorized by, organi by an organizing set of principles. A taxonomy is a special kind of framework which works across a continuum. Anderson and others have developed their taxonomy around two dimensions, cognitive process and knowledge. They created a table using cognition categories in the columns of the table and knowledge categories in the rows of the table. Here we can see how they organize these categories in the table. If we look closely at this table, we can see that the table moves from concrete to more abstract as we look from left to right and top to bottom. Items falling in the bottom right of the table then would be considered the most abstract. Okay, so the table looks pretty straightforward, but how does it work? How can Ms. Williams and I use the table, you ask? Anderson and others suggest that by placing objectives into the appropriate place in the table, teachers may get some help in answering what are considered four important questions. Anderson and others posit that teachers always consider what is important for students to learn in the limited school and classroom time that is available. This can be thought of as the learning question. Use of the taxonomy table can help by putting objectives into a common language which can provide perspective. Secondly, they put forward the question, how does one plan and deliver instruction that will result in high levels of learning for large numbers of students? This is called the instruction question. Use of the table can help separate the objectives into different types of learning that may be required. Different types of learning may likely need different instructional approaches. The table can help with those differences. Third, Anderson asks, How does one select or design assessment instruments and procedures that provide accurate information? This is the assessment question. Like the instruction question, the table can help identify the different types of assessment that may be necessary based on the different domains of the table. Finally, Anderson and the others ask, how does one ensure that objectives, instruction, and assessment are consistent with one another? Without alignment, instructions may not influence student performance. The table will allow for comparison of all three pieces, objectives, activities, and assessments. The greater they are aligned, the stronger the connections. Okay, Ms. Williams gets it, so how does she place her objectives in the table? She can think in terms of content and knowledge. In 1949, Ralph Tyler, an American educator, stated, The most useful form for stating objectives is to express them in terms which identify both the kind of behavior to be developed in the student and the content in which this behavior is to operate. In 2001, Anderson and others suggested that a verb in an objective describes the cognitive process and the noun describes the knowledge the students are expected to acquire. Let's look at an example using Tyler and Anderson's suggestions. Here's an objective that might be used as a basis for some instruction. The student will be able to name the five basic food groups developed by the Center for Disease Control. Sound like a concise and well-written objective? 
Okay, thinking about what Tyler said, is there a behavior identified in the objective? Is there content identified? And how about Anderson's point? Is there a verb that describes the cognitive process and a noun that describes the knowledge the students are expected to acquire? Well, Ms. Williams might say yes to both of those questions. She might say that the behavior or verb is present in the word name in the goal. Further, she may say the content or knowledge is present in the objective via the words five basic food groups. That looks like a nice clean goal which Ms. Williams can put into the table. Perhaps she'll put it in the factual row of the table and the remember column of the table. If Ms. Williams is able to place all of her objectives into the table, she may start to see some patterns in her objectives, and she also might see ways that she can do similar types of instruction and activities for similar objectives. Well, Ms. Williams is now on her way to developing better instruction. She's going to be able to use the table again later to help her answer those four organizing questions that Anderson put forward. Ultimately, her instruction is going to be much more precise and will better promote understanding on the part of her students. Try the taxonomy table with your own instructional goals and see if it helps you.